I'm late in getting up. It is the uh, uh, 25th. No, uh, yeah, it's the 25th of February, uh, 2021, and, and it is uh, 17 hours and 15 minutes into the day. I've got a clock in front of me, but it's barely visible because of the light. Uh, I wake up. I'm still in bed. This is the new thing. As a dream comes in and reveals much. But it reveals much in the manner that it tells me, it gives me a direction to move in. These are what are called directional dreams that sort of give me a suggestion in a fashion in which I may move. Uh, sorry about that, the camera is kind of shaky. Uh, I realized that my, my, my uh, part of my finger was covering the lens because it's over to the left. And that's not quite professional. I've got to make sure this is centered. <laughs> it's hard filming when you're in bed still. Uh, yeah, so I have had one of those directional dreams. It is... Uh, it, it It's a dream that becomes... Not necessarily cryptic, but... That... The scenarios that you occur in your dream provide a manner in which you should behave. And this is the same thing here. It reveals certain, certain aspects of what I do that uh, need to be kept uh, under hat, but can be discussed in means in other terms. Uh, and it gave me a direction to move in. And, and I'm I've, I finished that about a half hour ago, 45 minutes ago, but I've been lying in bed here, sort of uh, what we call finishing up the dream, mulling over the thoughts and ideas of where the dream has taken me and said, well, well, this must be something more significant. And as I began to sort of roll through it, uh, I began to realize that the dream was uh, one that sort of gives me direction in terms of where I should be going next and how I should be handling things. Uh, but that's that, that's kind of that's where, where the interesting part lies, is that it doesn't come out and say that directly. These are things that as you continue along, uh, as you wake from the dream specifically, and it stays within your mind, you, you continue to mull over uh, the various different possibilities of how the dream could have gone and what different actions you've done in there, and the different things you've seen. Uh, these all give, in some cases, indications of one, where you are, and then two, where you should be going, or where you possibly could be going. Because you don't necessarily have to be going in that direction. You don't have to take the direction that is suggested. It just simply pro provides the option, provides the experience in that direction and it's up to you, once you've awakened, to continue on in, in the dream, in, in the imagination. If the dream does continue in your imagination if uh, you uh, know how to do this. Um, it gives you the option to, to play it forward and to provide some idea of how it would play out. Uh, if you continued on this particular path, and the path is not necessarily an easy one, there is some are, are some issues surrounding it that could be problematic, or you know, be seen to be problematic. But and of course, there's also risk involved. There's always risk involved every time you take a path that's particularly unknown. But as an explorer, this is what you're designed. To, this is what you want to do. You want to go out and explore the unknown. But it's not always, it's not something that's palatable for everybody. So that's why it remains a suggestion and not necessarily a particularly pointed path. Anyways, uh, I think uh, that would be sufficient for now. And uh, I will proceed to get up and do the usual because uh, uh, in about... Uh, ooh... 40 minutes, I will be leaving uh, to my parents' house for dinner. All right.
Well, with only a few, uh, well, 13 minutes left in the day of the 25th, so it is uh, 23 hours and 47 minutes into the day of Thursday, February 25th, 2021. It's been an interesting day. I was in one of these altered states once again, where the dreams uh, followed me throughout most of the day. I didn't get out of bed till six, until about 5.30. I uh, did some gaming after that. But even while I was, I was up, uh, the dreams kind of stayed with me. It, it, it was, the, the ending dream was more significant than, uh, than the others. There are what I call points along, dreams that are points along the path, and then there are dreams that are non-sequential because they're, they're, they're part of the path. The dreams that are part of the path, path uh, remain hidden to a certain degree. Mm. Because my understanding of what's going on hasn't occurred yet. However, there are dreams where, and this is the ones that do really stick in the mind, that sort of stay with you the most of the day, is where enough chunks of the dream start to come together, and it's from your experiences. It, it, it's sort of it's sort of a, a window on how you experience things. These are not premonitions. They're not fortune telling. It's not clairvoyance. Or anything along those lines, although they can indeed assist or appear to be as such. And, and many gurus, those and the elders, the bishops who claim sometimes to have clairvoyance, uh, and it's announced that this is the case, uh, may not necessarily may not necessarily be what you think that they are. What they what you think they are. For myself, I don't experience this. This is something that is completely different. It, and it's partially because uh, I remember my dreams so much, I'm, I'm, I'm so functionally aware of the dreams, that there isn't the state of awe that, that in terms of being handed a revelation that one would typically expect. Because it, it, for me, it's like, it's, it's like being awake. Why is every day special? Why would why would I say being awake during the day and being aware of what's going on as you're going through it, your experiences? Why would I state that this is something that's special that's being revealed to me? And the thing is, I wouldn't, because it's my normal every my or my normal everyday awareness. And this is the same thing within the dream. It's part of my life. It's part of my day. And it's part of my experiences, it's part of my normal experiences. This is what I experience on a regular and average basis. So it's not something that's outside of my, it's like, hey, my, my realm. It's just sort of something that's part of who I am, part of the day. And it's more about how I react to a situation than anything else. Then, then, then this is how the dreams tend to change. It's, it's, it presents me with a scenario, or a situation, in which I need to respond to something. My response determines how the dream actually turns out. And in the dream, as you have these responses, you're given multiple options to take one path or another, to make one decision or another, to adjust how you feel about something, uh, to think about what, how you feel about something in terms of where your emotions are. Uh, and again, it's not about pushing aside or, or getting rid of the emotion. It's about dealing with it. How do you deal with this particular emotion like anger, fear, jealousy, hatred, rage? These are things that are negative. These are the negative components. That in many cases, if you're studying about chakra, these are the things that block your chakra. Uh, but the thing is, in, in the in the Hindu sense of things, where you're cleansing your chakra, uh, 
and, and you sort of create the, the, the straight alignment, the clearing of the block, the blockage that prevents the, the chief to flow from flowing properly from the chakra all the way through to, from the bottom to the top. Uh, there is about getting rid of things. This isn't about getting rid of things. This is about dealing with the issues, the emotions that you have, so that you can manage them. You never get rid of your fears, your emotions entirely. They're diminished to a certain point, and then once they're diminished to a certain point, other functionalities come in, but at the same time, other fears and other triggers come in that you have to deal with. So you never achieve the top of a point. You achieve some degree of advancement, but not the entirety. And this is this is the reality of gnosis. This is the reality uh, uh, to the uh, uh, the we'll call the awareness of the be of the beyond the call the meta knowledge. Uh, and it's part of the exploration of the universe that uh, began with Planck. Uh, and, and this is in terms of the sense of gnosis, because before Planck, the modern world had said, "Well, there's no more nothing beyond us." Everything is logical. Planck said not so fast. And this is because some of the experiments that he did, he did it in the ma in a manner where the purpose and, and, and uh, conclusions were kind of taken away. And he went outside the bounds of his, his predicted experiment and started to say, well, what happens if I do this? And what happens if I do that? And in this meandering, he began to realize that the, as his experiments showed not to be within line, not to be in line with the predicted results, uh, he began to realize that a large chunk of the w way we see the world is because we see the world this way. It's not just necessarily because it is what it is. And so he began to realize that there is more beyond the intellectual sense, and as he began to do this, uh, he brings physics into metaphysics, and it continues along. It continues along into with Einstein and into quantum mechanics. It extends into M theory, which is superstring theory, down into particle physics, uh, and, it, and it hasn't ended. It, it, it brings things into a line. My space, says, my space said, "Well, if this is the case, if the researchers are seeing this now, they're starting to see the quantum strangeness, the uncertainty, the, the, probab the, the probabilistic universe." then they must have seen this before. And so you won't go back in history and say, okay, where are they talking about this? And you find often in the, we'll call the, 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 the types of gnosis that you have out there, that this is what they're talking about. And I looked at uh, my my church, which is the early Christian church, and I realized there is a whole avenue that just simply hasn't been explored. And that's began my exploration in, 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 uh, in uh, metaphysics. And this is a contagion. This is what we're doing now in terms of gnosis is the continuation of this exploration in quantum physics. It's, it's the movement from Planck to metaphysics. This is what this is. And this is my log, this is my vlog, this is my journal. And it's our journal because Cyborg Alpha is an integral part of who I am. It's part of my life. And because it's the work on uh, cybernetics, it's the cybernetic entity of a cyborg. A cyborg is half human and half a machine, and the question is, well, how does one become? How does the machine interact with the human being? It, while in many cases it could be defined as something biologically implanted, but at the same time, it doesn't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily have to. It's about more or less a symbiotic relationship. There's the bus. Better centering, hopefully better sound, hopefully some sound. Uh, it is uh, 18 hours and 32 minutes into February 26th, uh, 2021. It is a Friday, and this is our second attempt. This is take number two. The first take, the first attempt at 6 o'clock, uh, filmed it, but there was no sound. And we're back in the Kauai Tea House kitchen because... 
Oh, well, I was cleaning up. I still am cleaning up. And I wanted to show you how I do my short order menu. There is this machine that I got. A, a, a nice little device. A lot of people have been seeing this on Instagram, on, uh, on vlogs, and so on and so forth. It's a nice tiny little device. Here we go. It plugs in. It's, it's got its own uh, power source. So you don't need a, 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 a hot plate. And you can make your own eggs. Uh, I chose, and I do primarily with this, the hard-boiled eggs. It's got a plate. Here's the pan and the reservoir where you put the water. Uh, you put the plate in and you put the eggs into the holes so it stands on its own. There is enough room for seven eggs. A good short order. You put the lid on with the lid on and then 20 minutes later you have hard boiled eggs very simple very quick and for me I said the amount of work that I do around here it's exam time in terms of the research and studying it's exam time all the time and more often than not I require and want a short order I mean, it cuts down on the amount of fast food you see how many how many how many people when you watch these vlogs when you watch vlogs how many of the vloggers are going out to get something to eat, to Chick-fil-A or whatever? Do you understand how much money that costs? It is easier to do it at home if you set up, if you know how to set up a short order system. A short order system, a short order menu is a, is a menu that you can prepare and be eating within 10 minutes. In other words, you're spending 10 minutes in the kitchen, that's it. That's short order. That's what fast food is. That's why people go out to get fast food because the food is already ready. And so they just simply pack it up, they package it up, they assemble it, package it up, and hand it to you. That's fast food. Cooking larger meals, which I do, uh, requires an hour to two hours, three hours, sometimes four hours. A uh, 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 roast for roast beef. If we're doing preparing, uh, if I make want to make a roast beef sandwiches, right? You buy the roast. It takes. On a slow cook, on a proper roast that gives you a good flavor, it takes a minimum of eight hours in the oven at 200 degrees uh, to get the proper flavors out and to get the right texture. And then you, then you, what you do is you have to. You, it actually takes three days because the first day you wrap it up in spices, you wrap it up in tin foil or parchment paper, however you want to do that. You stick it in the fridge. You allow it to sit in the fridge for about a day. So that the, f the flavors of the spice soak into the meat. That's what happens with the spices. Then you put it in the oven for eight hours. You take it out of the oven and you, s and you let it cool down. There's a cooling down period. Then you put it in the fridge for another day. So it takes you about three days to good make a good roast for sliced roast beef. It takes about three days of curing. Uh, the curing process takes about three days, and then you have good flavor for roast beef sandwiches. But that's time-consuming. So if you want to do short order, then you have to have something like like what I have here, like the uh, the egg maker. And what I did is I I, I did uh, ahead of time I did a batch of bacon. I did it in the oven. At 300 degrees, uh, took about 45 minutes to do. Then I have the toast, I have the eggs, and I had a nice toast and egg, egg breakfast. That's what I had for breakfast today. Uh, I made a shake with uh, iced tea instead of doing regular iced tea. I did. Uh, I put a banana in, I put uh, cocoa in, I put some sugar in. Uh, with uh, half tea, half water, one, one liter of half tea, half, uh, half, half, half tea, half milk. Put it in the blender, and so I had a, I had a uh, iced tea shake, and it was good. It was it, it was a good flavor, good, very healthy for you, because the teas I make the, the are more like the real Chinese teas where they're not processed. Uh, there's dehydrated fruit in there, so you get a good it, the the. When I went and looked at the nutrient rating for the different dehydrated dehydrated fruit I put in there, it's like taking a multivitamin. It's it's got all the nutrients you need in there. So 
you get uh, in on a short order, you could, can make very healthy food, very food that's very good for you. And at the same time, I'm just covering this up better than bake, uh, covering up the bacon better. Uh, you can create a good, healthy, short order menu. It's just a matter of the question is, are you going to do it or not? You know, is the preparation and how you do the preparation, that's what really matters. But at the same time, when I'm in here doing the kitchen, doing the work, because it's all done by memory, I don't have recipes. I learned from a lot of aunties and grandmothers I had in my church who were from these old uh, Greek and Syrian villages. Uh, they didn't use recipes. They learned from their grandmothers and their mothers. They taught them, they, they sort of taught them by watching how to cook. And then, of course, your first step is once you've seen, you've watched these techniques, and you sort of think you have the technique down, you go and try it yourself. The first few times, you're going to make a wreck. And, but as you keep going on, you learn from your mistakes. And eventually you get good at it. I've been doing this for 15 years. It's an, actually an excellent way to do a study in cultural anthropology. Cultural, cultural anthropology is about the history of mankind. Anthropos, which is the Greek word for man, but not man, the, the gender, but man, the species. Apparently people don't understand this today. Oh, man has a gender. No, man is human. It's the, the species. So what happens, there is no gender in, issue in Greek because man, in terms of the gender, is called andres. And man, the species, is called anthropos. So anthropo, anth anthropology, anthropology, right? the, study, the study are the words of, of human beings, the word, that type of study, is about human culture. It's not about uh, a, a, a gender study, if you will. Um, and you can do this within the kitchen. You, you can do this study in the kitchen. You can eat your way through uh, cultural um, anthropology. And that's one of, the, one of the ways they research it and to understand it. So rather than simply reading it, you want to experience it. I can do it right here in my kitchen. Anyways, I hope this ends up working out. I'm going to test the sound as soon as I finish here, and uh, I might be back <laughs> very shortly. It is now um, 18 hours and 40 minutes, so it's been about 10 minutes. I might be back in a few minutes to do this again. <laughs>